and gentlemen, welcome to the start of our Oscar Wilde West End Walk 2023. We've got a real treat for you today, and we're going to start off with a, a reading, a short scene from An Ideal Husband, which was first performed here in 1895. There were two Oscar Wilde plays here, uh, A Woman of No Importance in 1893, and then An Ideal Husband in 1895. So in this short scene, the role of Lord Goring is going to be played by Darcy Sullivan, and the role of Phipps, his butler, is going to be played by Neil Titley. So, welcome to both. Yes, Lord. Rather distinguished ladies, I am the only person of the smallest importance in London at present who wears a button. Yes, my lord, I have observed that. You see, Phipps, fashion is what one wears oneself. What is unfashionable is what other people wear. <laughs> <laughs> yes, my lord. Just as vulgarity is simply the conduct of other people. Yes, my lord. And falsehoods, the truths of other people. Yes, my lord. Other people are quite dreadful. The only possible company is oneself. Yes, one, my lord. Love oneself is the beginning of a lifelong romance, Phipps. Yes, my lord. <laughs> Don't think I quite like this buttonhole, Phipps. Makes me look a little bit too old. <laughs> <laughs> I don't observe any alteration in your lordship's appearance. You don't, Fitz? No, my lord. I'm not quite sure. In the future, a more trivial buttonhole for Saturday mornings, Fitz. I will speak to the florist, my lord. Uh, she has had a loss in her family lately, which perhaps accounts for the lack of triviality your lordship complains of in the buttonhole. <laughs> Extraordinary thing about the lower classes in England. They're always losing their relations. Yes, my lord. They are extremely fortunate in that respect. <laughs> <laughs> this is just a very short rundown of the theatre as it relates to Oscar Wilde. So this is not the first Theatre Royal Haymarket. The original one was actually uh, next door on uh, the uh, next door site up the hill and it opened in 1720. It, uh, the ground landlord of the Haymarket is the Crown, the Crown Estate. So there was a 99 year lease starting in 1720 which expired in 1819. The man who was running the theatre, David Morris, was desperate to get his lease renewed because if he didn't he would lose the business altogether. If a lease falls in then the buildings on the site revert to the ground landlord. It was very fortunate for Morris that he was negotiating for a new lease at the same time that John Nash was creating Regent Street, the biggest development ever pushed through in the centre of London and the most successful. The <laughs> Act of Parliament for the new street was very far-sighted it wasn't just a question of building one street, but relating it to the surrounding areas in a way that would create a series of elegant spaces which now constitute what we call the West End. Orig uh, originally, Charles Street, which faces the front of the theatre, uh, did not join up with the Haymarket. It stopped short. There used to be a coaching in on the other side of the road. So that was demolished to allow Charles Street to be brought through to the Haymarket, which created a vista <coughs> from St. James's Square. John Nash, who was given extraordinary powers in the creation of Regent Street, uh, told Morris that he could have his new 99-year lease, but he had to abandon the old theatre and build a new one on the site next door with Nash as the architect so that this would close the prospect from St. James's Square. 
so uh, that's why we have a classical temple front on the front of the theater. At the time, the <coughs> prevailing aesthetic theory was the picturesque. And one of the principles of the picturesque was a fine prospect with a terminating feature, usually a classical temple. So that's what happened here. So the Haymarket was already, by that stage, the premier theatre in London, where you went to see a good performance of a good play. And it's always maintained that reputation. In 1880, Squire and Marie Bancroft acquired the lease, and they decided that the auditorium was so run down, they were going to tear it out and put in a new one. So at this point, Vanessa, could you pass around that photo? Oh, you've got the photos of the, the Bancroft Auditorium. It had two interesting features. The one everyone commented on was that the Bancrofts abolished the pit. The pit was the cheaper area of seats behind the orchestra stalls. But the Bancrofts did away with the pit altogether so that this whole area was stalls. The Bancrofts were seriously interested in making money. And they didn't want to be selling tickets at two shillings when they, uh, in the pit when they could get ten shillings in the stalls. But the other interesting feature at the Bancroft <coughs> Auditorium, which wasn't so much commented on, is that it was deliberately old-fashioned. The, uh, the stall, the, the lower area of the seating, abutted directly onto the first tier which they called the, uh, the dress, uh, the bal balcony stalls. <coughs> so if you were sitting in the stalls, you could easily talk to someone in the first tier. You could almost shake hands with them. But, at the, but that left the Haymarket as the only theatre in the West End which did, hadn't taken <coughs> advantage of the advances in building technology which allowed the whole of the first tier to be raised up to put seats underneath it. So the first tier, which is the dress circle, in every other theatre had the seating going underneath the dress circle. The Bancrofts didn't want that. They wanted to create a very intimate, luxurious atmosphere. And as you can see from those images, everyone sitting in the stalls had their own armchair. They had plenty of space. Uh, they could see people who they were used to seeing at receptions and balls and concerts. The, the upper classes in those days consisted of only a few hundred people. So it was very intimate and it was very upper class. The trouble was that intimacy was achieved at the expense of capacity. It was very small. So the, uh, the Bancroft Auditorium, <coughs> I can this here somewhere. The Bancroft Auditorium, it's seated... Uh, Oh, I can't find it. Seat about 174, which is very small. So they sold the lease on, uh, in 1885, they'd made so much money they were able to retire. They sold the lease to their front of house manager. That didn't work all that well. Two years later, he sold it on to Herbert Beerbone Tree. So Beerbone Tree moved in here for, <coughs> uh, uh, from 1887 onwards. And the two famous productions that we all know were A Woman of No Importance and An Ideal Husband. A Woman of No Importance was his own production. Uh, he starred as Lord Illingworth, and Oscar said he got stuck as Lord Illingworth. He was trying to talk like Lord Illingworth when he wasn't on the stage. <laughs> but he didn't produce An Ideal Husband. He sublet the theatre to the actor Lewis Waller and his business partner Harry Morell. They rented the place because to, uh, Tree was taking his company on tour to America. So while they were appearing in New York, there was a big hit play that everybody wanted to see. Tree was acting every night, couldn't get to see it. He'd taken his half-brother Max Beerbohm along with him as his secretary. Max turned out to be a totally useless secretary because he was composing every business letter 
as if it was a, an essay for the yellow book. <laughs> so the letters never got sent. So he was fired and Tree hired a proper secretary, which left Max at free. So he asked Max to go and look at this play and tell him, should he buy the UK rights? So Max went to see the play, came back and said, it's absolutely hopeless, far too vulgar for London audiences, all right for the Americans, but no one in London would want to see this. Herbert Beerbohm Tree didn't trust Max's judgment <laughs> in matters of show business. So on the last night in New York, which was the only night when he wasn't acting, he went to see the play, went backstage in the interval, bought the rights. The play was Trilby, and it gave him his most famous role as Svengali. It opened later in 1895, and it was a huge success. Trilby made so much money that it enabled Tree to realize his dream of building his own theater, which is Her Majesty's on the other side of the road where the Phantom of the Opera is playing. It, the Her Majesty's is a very beautiful theater. He loved it so much he virtually moved into it. There's a big flat up in the dome where he used to entertain. His wife said he used to, he ought to send out invitations saying, Herbert Beerbohm Tree at Dome. <laughs> <laughs> so 50 years later, Max Beerbohm was telling this story to a journalist and he ended up by saying, so you see, I was right about Trilby. <laughs> Beerbohm Tree, when he moved over the road, sold his lease to his business manager, who was a man called Frederick Harrison. He went into partnership for the management with an actor called Cyril Maud. Cyril Maud was the artistic director, chose the plays, directed them, cast them. His wife, Winifred Emery, was the star. Uh, so they took over that, they were still using the Bancroft Auditorium. In 1905, Frederick Harrison decided this, it was just a waste of space to have so few seats on the ground level. So he tore out the whole auditorium again in, uh, 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 and replaced it with the one which is here now, which has the, what we now regard as the normal arrangement. The, uh, the dress circle is sufficiently high above here for the seats to extend underneath it. So the capacity of the lower level went up from 170 odd to um, 250 stalls and he restored the pit behind it, 200 in the pit. So the capacity had increased by about 250%. The only element of the Bancroft Auditorium which he retained is this golden picture frame which had already become iconic. It was famous. It used to go all the way around. Used to, there used to be a bar across the bottom, but that was removed because it was muffling the orchestra. But the picture frame <coughs> is here to this day, so this is the actual frame through which the first performances of A Woman of No Importance and An Ideal Husband were seen. Here we are at the Theatre Royal Haymarket, the tour with the Oscar Wilde Society, and we're about to go into the Royal Box. That is the Royal Box there. Thank you, Robert. Tonight you can walk past the Queen. The Royal Blue is really boring. <laughs> the Royal Blue is really, really boring. <laughs> 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 it's not, definitely not worthy of the beautiful box. Definitely not worthy of the beautiful box. And if we and were royalty... The withdrawing room. Oh my God. This would be our view of the stage. <laughs> 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 
This is where we would be seated. The plaque at the end, commemorating the centenary of an ideal husband, was unveiled by Sir John Gielgud in 1995. It was the very first society event that I attended. And he said when he was unveiling it that uh, if Oscar was here today, he would want to know why his plaque is at the back door and not on the front of the building. He also told an interesting story. He said when he was a young man in London, he was walking down the street with a friend who stopped to talk to somebody and after a few minutes this person moved on. He wasn't introduced. So he said, who was that? The friend said, that was Reggie Turner. He said he'd spent the rest of his life regretting that he'd missed the one opportunity he would ever have to speak to someone who knew Oscar Wilde. Sir John Gielgud loved this theatre so much. During the Second World War, he had himself appointed <coughs> air raid warden and moved into the star dressing room on the top floor while he directed a series of magnificent productions designed to keep up people's spirits. The last of these productions was Lady Windermere's Fan. He directed it, Cecil Beaton designed it. It opened in 1945, just before the end of the war. It became and remains the most successful production of an Oscar Wilde play ever. It ran for very nearly two years. So the Oscar Wilde connection with the Haymarket is very strong indeed. Uh, ladies and gents, this, this is the site of the old St. James's Theatre. It was built in 1835 for a man called John Graham, who was the most successful tenor of his day. He thought he could, he, he made a great deal of money singing other people's productions and thought he could run his own theatre. Unfortunately, he built it in the wrong place. In theatre, more than in almost any other business, location is everything. You only have to be a couple of hundred yards away from where people are used to going to the theatre for it to make the difference between success and failure. The St. James was always a failure. Uh, management's changed every two or three years because this area is too quiet, King Street is too quiet, we're too far to the west, all the other theatres, the Haymarket is about the nearest of the West End theatres. So nobody knew what to do with, with the old St. James. In, uh, between 1879 and 1888, a group of three actors, Mr. and Mrs. Kendall and John Hare, took it on. They were all popular actors, they had their own followings. They made a reasonable success, but in the end they decided it was too much like hard work to try to get people here. So they uh, moved to another, they moved to other theatres. However, George Alexander took over the St. James in 1890. He was very young at the time to be a West End manager, and he was taking a big risk by taking on this theatre. But he made it a huge success. This was the golden age of the St. James Theatre. He ran it from 1890 to 1918 when he died. <coughs> and he'd been acting on stage here a few weeks before he died. He created the idea of the St. James play, witty, sophisticated, elegant. He did what was called high comedy and historical costume drama. One of his most successful plays was The Prisoner of Zen. But the two plays which, of course, we remember <coughs> 
are the original performances of Lady Windermere's fan in 1892 and the importance of being earnest in 1895. Lady Windermere's fan made a huge amount of money. The importance of being earnest didn't because the scandal caused it to shut down before the management had recouped the costs. Alexander tried a revival of it in 1902. Uh, that was a flop. Then he revived it again in 1909, and it was a huge success. It ran for 11 months. It was his third most popular play ever. Because by 1909, things had moved on. De Profundis had been published in 1905 in part. Uh, the Methuen edition of Oscar Wilde's works appeared in 1908. So there was a feeling that it was time to forgive and forget. After George Alexander's death, Pieter passed to an American impresario called Gilbert Miller. He had it from 1918 to 1957, 39 years. I think it's the longest time that one man has been in charge of a West End theatre. And over the years he tried everything. He produced plays himself, he sublet the theatre to other managements, and famously he went into co-management with Laurence Olivier, uh, starting in 1950, that went on and off for four years. It wasn't a great success, except in 1951, uh, they, they produced, um, they were given a grant by the, uh, not the Arts Council, but, um, yes, sorry, it would, have been, it would have been the Arts Council by then. They were given a grant to do something special for the Festival of Britain. And they produced twin, twin productions of Shakespeare's Antony and Cleopatra and uh, George Bernard Shaw's Caesar and Cleopatra. Vivian Lee was Cleopatra in both productions. Laurence Olivier was Mark Antony and Antony and Cleopatra he was Caesar and Caesar and Cleopatra. They were enormously successful. Vivian Lee was one of the biggest stars in the world at the time because of Gone with the Wind. She was incredibly beautiful. She was a great actress. So it was the hottest ticket in the West End. Didn't make any money because the show was so spectacular with big sets and with the costumes. Even on a full house, they couldn't, come, couldn't make profit. But after running here for three months, it went to Broadway, where it went into a bigger theatre, higher ticket prices, and they did eventually make some money. However, Gilbert Miller, by this time, was getting fed up with the struggle of trying to make the St. James Theatre play. And he realised that the site was worth more than the theatre. So he sold it for development. There was a protest led by Laurence Olivier and Vivian Lee. They had a march through London. Vivian Lee disrupted the sitting of the House of Lords by standing up in the gallery to shout about this. But there, uh, Winston Churchill said he would give 500 pounds to any campaign to save the St. James Theatre. But there was nothing that could be done. Now all theatres are protected by a blanket conservation order but there was no legislation in the 1950s. So the, the theatre was demolished and it was replaced with an office block that was called St. James's House. It was in the brutalist style and it was peculiarly hideous. The only decoration at all on the buildings was there were four balconies on the front which had base relief sculptures on them. The building was so horrible, it was demolished in the 1980s and replaced with this one. And the only thing they kept were the four sculptures. One of them is incredibly badly sighted under that archway. You probably didn't even see it as you walked past. And it depicts Laurence Olivier and Vivian Lee. I think it's actually the best of the four. These three, here we have Oscar. On this side we have 
Dorian Gray and the painting. On this side we have Salome with the head of John the Baptist. At the top, the figure in the middle is George Alexander. I'm not sure which character. Uh, it looks like as if he's playing a Shakespearean character, but actually he wasn't known for his Shakespearean roles. Might be prisoner of Zenda. And at the bottom, we've got Gilbert Miller. I don't see why he should be commemorated here, because he was the man who pulled it down. So we've got Miller in the middle, and on either side, what looked to me like other versions of Miller. And we've got the mask of tragedy there, and the mask of comedy here. This is the fourth panel that Robert was describing. Okay, uh, this is a very, very short one. Uh, basically, it's where Oscar Wilde would have shot. And uh, first of all, you've got up there, you've got some uh, James Fox in tobacconists. Oscar was dating cigarettes a day, man, so he would have probably been there quite a lot. Uh, if you want uh, shoes, you've got lobs over there. But in fact, the smartest pair of lobs you'll get in Paris, uh, not there. Uh, and the next one is locks down there for hats. And then finally, the most important of the lot is Berry Brothers, which is the, uh, the alcohol uh, wine store down there. So that's it. And the end of the line, that's St. James's Palace. So there we are. He rented rooms in 10 to 11 here. His rooms were to the left of the front door, but there are two doors, so it's hard to know which of those windows was his window. Uh, unfortunately for Oscar, the building had a butler who recorded the visitors. So he was able to make himself very useful to the Marquis of Queensbury. Uh, he was able to find out that Oscar had been visited by various rent boys did you ever take rooms yourself, Mr. Wilde, in addition to having your house in Tight Street? Yes. Where? In um, 10 and 11 St. James Place. How long had you these rooms? From October till the beginning of April, I fancy. October of what year? From October of uh, 1893, I think, till the, uh, the end of March or beginning of April, 1894. Did Lord Alfred Douglas stay in these rooms? He has stopped there. They're not very far from Piccadilly. No. Now you were staying, I think, from October 1893, you told me, to April 1884 at 10 St. James Place. I was not staying there, no, no. But you had rooms there. I had room there, yes. You sometimes slept there. Yes, oh, oh yes. Was your house in Tite Street shut up then? Oh, no, I, I was living in Tite Street. Were your rooms on the ground floor? Yes. Near the hall door? Yes. A sitting room where you went in? Yes. Immediately you went in, and a bedroom off the sitting room? Yes. Were there two hall doors to the house? Uh, there, there were two houses. 10 and 11. 10 and 11, yes. Of course, they communicate. Uh, there are two houses. Did you ask Taylor to tell Charlie Parker to call them? Did I ask him? Yes. My impression is that Mr. Taylor wrote to me and said that Charlie Parker was in town and would like to see me. Have you got that letter? I have not got that letter, no. That is my impression, that I wrote to Alfred Taylor and said to tell him that Charlie Parker could come to tea any time he liked. Come to tea? Yes. Afternoon tea? Was it afternoon tea? Yes, afternoon tea, certainly. Did Parker come there? Yes. To tea? Yes. <coughs> How often? Oh, I should think of five or six times. What was he doing? Nothing. What was he doing where? At St. James Place. What was he doing? Yes. Visiting me. Visiting you? Yes. Was he alone? Sometimes he came with Mr. Taylor. Sometimes he, he was alone. I liked his society. Very well, we will see. Did you give him presents? I gave him a, I forget what I gave him, a, I gave him a Christmas present. Did you give him a chain? Chain? A chain ring? No, no. A chain ring, you know the kind of thing I mean. Um, I, I don't think that was my Christmas present. 
I was sure, I'm sure that it was not. Did you give him a cigarette case? I, yes, I, I gave him a cigarette case. That was my Christmas present. Did you give him money? Uh, yes, I gave him three pounds, four pounds. Three pounds or four pounds? Yes. Was that on the occasion of various visits? Oh, no, no. He, he was hard up and asked me would I do it. I, I, I did it. You did? Yes. Did you give it to them all at once? Yes, all at once. What? All at once. Was he in your bedroom at any time? Not that I remember. What? Not that I remember. My, my bedroom was off my sitting room. If you ask whether when I was putting my coat on in my bedroom he came in, I, I dare say he did. I don't see why he should not. But he was never in my bedroom in the sense that you imply. Do you recollect as a fact his being in your bedroom? No, I don't re recollect as a fact that he was in my bedroom. The bedroom was off my sitting room. I don't see why he should not have done it. I, I'm, I'm not fencing with your question. No? No. Did improprieties take place between No, no. How long used he to stay on each of these occasions when he came to tea? Oh, an hour, I think. Yes. yes. What was he doing all that time? Do you ask me what a young man does when he comes to have tea with me? He has his tea, he smokes a cigarette, and I hope he enjoys it. Really? What I would like to ask you is this. What was there in common between you and this young man of this class? I will tell you, Mr. Carson. I delight in the society of people much younger than myself. I like those who may be called idle and careless. I recognize no distinct social distinctions at all of any kind. And to me, youth, the mere fact of youth is so wonderful that I would sooner talk to a young man for half an hour than even be, well, cross-examined in court. The Albemarle was one of Oscar's favorite hotels. He brought Edward Shelley and Sidney Maver here to seduce them. He was staying here when Lady Windermere's fan opened in 1892. And he was staying here during rehearsals for a woman of no importance in 1893 when Pierre Louis witness the distressing scene of Oscar uh, of Constance turning up with his correspondence from Tite Street and Oscar telling her he could no longer remember the house number because it was so long since he'd been home. The Albemarle Club, the old Albemarle Club was here where the scaffolding is number 13 Albemarle Street. This is the site, but it's not the building. This building is 1922. The club opened in 1874, specifically to have both women and men as members. It was slow to establish itself because this was such a revolutionary idea. The, the world referred to it as the new bisexual Albemarle Club. However, by the 1890s, it was a success. The bit, as I say, this is not the original building, but the buildings to the left are much older. They're 18th century. Numbers 14 and 15 were Carter's Hotel, where the Marquis of Queensbury used to stay when he was in London. So when he decided to leave his card for Oscar Wilde, he didn't have far to walk. He went into the club, demanded to see Oscar. The, the porter said Oscar wasn't in, so he scribbled on his card, left it for the porter saying, Oscar Wilde posing as a sodomite. Uh, the porter looked at the card before he put it into an envelope. The fact that he looked at the card made the libel, it meant the libel had been published, hence the legal action. The, um, 
The Albemarle Club was badly damaged by its association with the scandal and the membership declined. In 1909 it moved to other premises but then it eventually it closed in 1941. There is another Albemarle Club here, you can see the letter A. Uh, it offers lively, bubbly nights of fun and entertainment. <laughs> uh, uh, we're looking down the, uh, over there actually. Uh, that is the corner where uh, uh, Marquis of Queensbury met his uh, eldest son, who was Percy Douglas, Percy Douglas's elder brother. And they met on that corner during the whole wild in Brogdeo, and that is where they had the fist fight down there on that corner and they were arrested and they were put up, brought up in front of the magistrate at the same time as the whole Oscar Wilde trials were going on. Uh, next one down, that's White Club, where Bosey Douglas was a member uh, but uh, he was eventually thrown out because he went bankrupt and they don't allow bankrupts in White Club, so there we are. <laughs> Right, over here we've got Henry Irving uh, lived on that corner and uh, I'm not going to say much about him apart from one story that he was uh, legendary, legendarily generous. He was a very generous man. And there was one story about him. One, one day, <coughs> excuse me, one day he overheard his business manager, Bram Stoker, refusing to hire an elderly woman for a job at the Lyceum. Irving suggested that she could take care of the theatre cats. Stoker answered that they already had three women taking care of the cats. Irving was not deterred. You must find her something. Let her look after the three women that are looking after the three cats. <laughs> <laughs> on, the first night, on the first night of Richard III, Irving was so drunk, he came back here fell down the stairs and twisted his ankle and they had to cut the, cancel the show for a week while he recovered. Although actually I would have thought playing Richard III with a limp was a pretty good idea. <laughs> this, this building is the old Grosvenor Gallery. It was founded by Sir Coote Lindsay, a Scottish artist who was frustrated by the constant rejection of his work by the Royal Academy. From 1875, he began to plan his own gallery. Unable to find an existing gallery, he built this, using his wife's fortune. His wife Blanche was a Rothschild. It was built in a most luxurious style, more like a drawing room than a public building. And the pictures were hung as they would be in a private house rather than being stacked right up to the ceiling as they were at the Royal Academy. Oscar Wilde was present at the opening and he wrote a review of it for the Dublin University magazine, which was his first published prose work. The gallery was instantly famous because that first exhibition contained Whistler's painting, Nocturne in Black and Gold, Oscar was dismissive of it, saying it was interesting to look at for about as long as it takes to look at a real rocket. But John Ruskin went much further and said, I never expected to hear a coxcomb ask 200 guineas for flinging a pot of paint in the public space. Whistler sued for libel and he won, but he sued Ruskin for libel. He won, but he was only awarded one farthing in damages. And he didn't get his costs, so he was bankrupted by the costs. The Grosvenor became associated with the aesthetic movement, and artists who were unlikely to be accepted at the Royal Academy, such as Whistler, Walter Crane, and Edward Burne Jones. Hence, Greenery Gallery, Grosvenor Gallery in patience. The Lindsay's marriage broke down in 1882. Blanche withdrew from the gallery and it closed soon afterwards. Uh, it used to have the most magnificent entrance. Uh, you can see it in this, the pictures were passing around, which came from a church in Venice designed by Palladio. 
at some stage that entrance disappeared, I don't know where it's gone. But otherwise the building does look just the same. Basically uh, Oscar Wilde obviously had many connections here, including that trip painting of him uh, dispensing wisdom to all and sundry. Uh, and, uh, but he wasn't very keen on the Royal Academy painters. And uh, this is what he had to say about them. Um, the English painter and the English critic. Great heavens, mediocrity bellowing to mediocrity. I met one of the Royal Academy painters, the, the RAs. In fact, there were several standing around at the time, disguised as artists. Anyway, this particular man had that curious mixture of bad painting and good intentions that always entitles a man to be called a representative British artist. I asked him whether his celebrated picture of um, waiting for the last omnibus or spring day at Barker and Dobson's was it really all done by hand. He replied rather coldly that it was. But it seems to me that the only artistic process with which the RAs are thoroughly familiar is that of varnishing. Still, some of them are possible. If they have not exactly opened the eyes of the blind, they have given great encouragement to the short-sighted. <laughs> Nothing sums up the English artist better than comparison to the French. Now in France, every bourgeois wishes to become an artist. But in England, every artist wishes to become a bourgeois. Thank you. <laughs>